Family, what's going on? How y'all doing? Listen, y'all, inflation is real out here in these streets, isn't it? Everybody's feeling it. Yesterday's price is not what? Today's price, right? Everything is going up from groceries to gas to rent to cars to housing, car insurance, right? Everything has gone up and everybody is feeling the pinch. And let me tell you something. If you do what the culture tells you to do, guess what? You're going to end up broke and with broken results. But if you do what the creator says, you're going to end up redeemed and you're going to have redeemed results. Anybody need some redeemed results today, y'all? But everything is going up, y'all. I mean, remember we used to go to fast food places because it was cheap. It wasn't always fast, right? But it was cheap. But even that is going up. I, I found this chart on the internet recently, and this is like 2024 prices of like some of your favorite fast food places. Y'all need to stop going there, right? Look at McDonald's, y'all. I mean, the McChicken has went up 201%. A cheeseburger, remember you used to have the dollar cheeseburger? It went up 215%. I know I heard they got some like value meals that they're trying to reintroduce now to pull people back in because hardly anybody's going to Taco Bell prices. Look at Taco Bell. I mean, a burrito went up like 118%. I mean, even the Christian chicken place is feeling it, y'all. Close on Sunday. You're my Chick-fil-A, right? Even Chick-fil-A. But look, look at Chick-fil-A, though. Not as bad. Not as bad. They're Christian. They're, they're, not, they're not hitting you as bad. But they still got increases. Not, not in the 100 and 200%. But, but man, uh, the deluxe chicken sandwich, the large milkshake, the waffle fries, everything has gone up. So, so how do we survive this? And how do we flourish in a season like this? Well, again, if you do what the culture tells you to do, you're going to end up probably broke and with broken results. But if you do what the Redeemer says, you're going to end up flourishing and with redeemed results. And so today I want to talk to you about three lies that the culture tells us about money and, and what God's word says, what is really the truth. So if you guys would stand with me, we're going to open up today and read some words from Jesus. And this is found in the Gospel of John. And Jesus says this, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in what? But will have the light of life. Light and darkness. And right now, if you think about it, the topic of money is a very dark place. It's a very dark topic for a lot of people in culture today. It's a place of frustration. It's a place of bondage. It's a place of guilt. It's a place of embarrassment for people that made mistakes. But let me tell you something. Look at me, y'all. When you put anything through, when you filter it through the lens of Scripture, listen, everything changes. And there can be light. When lies get exposed, hope can be birthed, pain can be turned into joy, transformation can happen when you filter it through the lens of Scripture. Anybody here need some transformation today? Yeah. It can happen. It can happen when that light gets shined in, but it, but it starts with truth being discovered and then truth being applied. So let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for truth. Even though the culture lies to us, tries to scam us, tries to take us down the wrong path so many times, uh, your word is truth. And so God, as we look at some truth today, even on this topic of, of finances and stuff and possessions and money, God, I pray you'll shine some light in some areas of our life that maybe we've fallen for some of the lies and it's hurt us. And we're especially feeling it in a time when the prices have gone up on everything. It's exposing some of the bad habits and the lies that maybe some of us have fallen into. So, God, help us today to see it and, and correct our course. Give us the strength and the courage to do that. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Give somebody a high five before you're seated. What's up to everybody that's worshiping online? We're so grateful you guys are with us today. So listen, fam, this is part two of our series, Surviving Inflation, Learning to Flourish Even in Tough Times. And if you missed last Sunday, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and watch it. Last week we talked about even though inflation is a reality, like you've got options. options. You've got options. The, the good news is there is some options. There are some things you could do. Last week we talked about a lot of biblical principles and practical advice. Again, if you missed it, 
go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. By the way, we got to celebrate today because our YouTube channel this past week just hit 5,000 subscribers. Let's go. Yeah. So shout out to our media, social media director. Y'all give it up for Hope. She, she works hard on that. She made that beautiful graphic as well. But hey, if you guys are not subscribed, if you're not tapped in, if you're watching right now and you're not subscribed, like, like hit that subscribe button. Um, we put out content pretty much every single day to encourage people to discover, develop, and display Jesus Christ in every... That's our mission statement if you didn't know. You're going to hear it later. We talk about it every week, every week before you leave, right? So last week we also um, announced that we had a financial class uh, with our partners Thrivent that's coming up uh, during the 1145 service. And, you know, we said, hey, we got 40 seats for y'all. <sighs> but somebody on our team forgot to cap the, 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 the sign-up number. And so I'm not going to say any names, Pastor Adam. Um, we love Pastor Adam. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, it's okay because it's good for you because a lot more people got in the class now. Got in the class. Just a few. Just a few. We quadrupled the seating capacity. 160 of y'all signed up before we turned it off. So, so everybody ain't going to fit in that classroom. So we are moving the class. If you're going to the class, it is going to be in the gym next service. And I know some people are like, oh, is there a waiting list? I didn't get signed up. Like, I, just see Pastor Adam. Maybe he'll get you a seat. There, there, we can, we'll squeeze you in. There's room. There's room in the gym. Pastor Chris was like, no. Like, you can stand. You can stand in the back and take notes. Like, like there's, there's room in there if you really still want to go to that. But, uh, but yeah, so that's a good thing. Good thing. Because uh, this is a pain point. A lot of people are going through stuff with their, with their finances, y'all. And so today we're going to talk about lies that the culture tells us about money. And I encourage you guys to take some notes today in the Crossover app. Open that up. If you didn't know, you can download that. And uh, here's number one. Here's the first big lie the culture tells us about money. You will be happy when you have what they have. You'll be happy when you have what they have. And so we can start to look at all the stuff that they have, all the brands that they have. Like, oh, man, if I could just get that Land Rover, then I'd be happy. Oh, man, if I could get that Gucci. Oh, man, if I could get that Mercedes, I would be, woo. If I could get that Louis purse, all oh, that Louis bag right there, I could get that Rolex watch, that Versace. That, you know, we, we start to look at what everybody else has, and we say, man, if I could just do that, I, I would be happier. If I could get a house that's a little bigger, if I could get a car that's a little newer, an apartment that's a little bit bigger, like then I would be happy. Well, you know what? The Bible talks a lot about money and possessions and stuff, and it waves a lot of red flags about it. There's a lot of warnings about when people start to get caught up in this kind of chase. There was a story about the rich young ruler in the scripture that Jesus talks about. There's a story in the book of Luke where Jesus tells a story about this guy that was wealthy and had a harvest. And then like the harvest was so great, but instead of being generous, he just built bigger barns and kept all the stuff for himself. And you know what Jesus called him? A fool. It's like one of the only times in scripture you see Jesus call somebody a fool. Right? You look over in the book of James and you can see uh, the apostle Paul. He is calling out the elites, the rich people of Jerusalem and saying, hey, you guys have forgotten about the poor and you guys are just hoarding all of your wealth. And so we see a lot of different red flags that the Bible throws up around money and possessions and luxury and stuff, all that stuff. So let me say this. Crossover Church is not a church that's into the prosperity gospel. We're not. At the same time, we're not into the poverty gospel either. Because those are the two extreme ends. Somebody say context. We like to take things in context, scripture in context here at our church. That's the way we preach it and teach it. And so if you look at some of those things and you're in some settings, you, you, you could be like, oh, man, I mean, the, the Bible just wants us to be poor. and We just should be poor. And we just, no, in context, that's not what it's saying. The Bible doesn't say you can't have nice stuff, but what it says is the stuff can't have you. And that's the problem. When we want what they have and we fall for that lie, we want this, the stuff begins to have us. And when you go into debt for the stuff, guess what? It has you. You're in bondage. And when you get in debt, guess what you lose? You lose options. You don't have as many options. God is a calling on some of your lives to do amazing things. 
to step out of faith and start something and do something with the gifts he put in you. But you're stuck and you can't do it because you got this weight of all this debt on your shoulders. And you, you, you don't have any options. You're like, I got to stay at this job. I got I to play it safe. And God's saying, no, I need you to step out. And you just feel like you're locked in. So it's not just with money, though. It's, it's not just with debt. But even when your possessions, when your stuff that you're chasing after, when it has your heart and, and it has you on an emotional level, and you count on that for your purpose, you count on that for your peace, and guess what? It has you. It has you. And it's not in the place that it's supposed to be in your life. Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, no one can serve two masters. You either love one and hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can have money, but we're not going to serve it. Y'all feel me? Right? But we live in a culture that's devoted to money, devoted to stuff. It's their everything, right? And when that becomes your foundation, the way that you think, like other thoughts begin to creep in, and you might not even catch it at first. But what begins to happen is you, you start to look at what everybody else has, and you're scrolling and just be, man, if I could just have what they have. Be honest with me, Teddy, for a second. How many of y'all ever got caught up in the comparison trap? Yeah, you're not alone. We, we look at what everybody else has. We can look at it all the time right here on our phones, right? And, and here's what that does when we get caught up in the comparison trap. If you're taking notes today, comparison will either make you feel superior or it'll make you feel inferior, right? It'll either make you feel inferior or it'll make you feel superior and neither honors God. Neither. Right? You can start thinking you all that, or you can start thinking you're nothing. Right? Anybody remember the old school saying, like, we're trying to keep up with the Joneses? Yeah. Right? Let, let, let me give you some information today. The Joneses are broke. <laughs> Stop trying to keep up with them. According to Forbes.com, they put out an article this year, and close to 80% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Close to 80%. And another 40%, they don't even have $400 to cover a $400 emergency. Right? So you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, and they can't even keep up with themselves. They're living a lifestyle they can't even afford. We talked about it last week. America right now has the highest debt level ever with credit card debt, $1.142 trillion. Trillion with a T. Not billion, trillion. That's how much credit card debt that we have, Right? But, you know, we stuck right here, and we just looking to, through all the social media, and we looking, oh, man, they at that fancy restaurant. Oh, man, so-and-so just got a new car. Oh, man, they on, a, they on a cruise again. Oh, man, I wish I could go on a cruise. Oh, man, that, oh, man, my sister, she just she remodeled her kitchen. Oh, man, it's so beautiful. My kitchen is trash, man. I, uh, you know, and, and we're just looking through all that stuff. But remember, social media is just the highlights. Some of those people can afford it, about 20%. But the other 80%, what you don't see is, is how they had to take out a second mortgage for that kitchen. How they're struggling and they're in so much debt right now because they took on that car payment or because they went and bought something that wasn't really, you know, in their budget. We, we don't see all that, right? So now they're stressed out. They're overwhelmed. They're, they're freaking out, right? Uh, so how do we break free of the comparison trap? Well, well, you know, the hood, another nickname for the hood is the trap. Why do they call it the trap? Because people get stuck in it. They get stuck in generational cycles of poverty and brokenness and addiction and, and broken families. And it seems like generation after generation gets stuck in the trap. Well, you know what the new trap is now? Social media. It's like the new trap. That people get stuck in that thing for hours and hours. And it just becomes cycles of getting happy and getting sad and getting uh, disappointed and, uh, you know, getting jealous of people and imagining things and fantasizing things and overspending, and it just becomes a trap. Some of you are caught in that trap, and you know what that trap also then becomes? It can become the trap of pretending. That's called the imposter trap, where you try to be something that you're not. We know, we, we've all seen this on, on social media. Um, people are putting out a perception that they have way more than they really have, you see people, like, taking pictures, like, buy exotic cars. 
by maybe into, hey, can I get a quick picture in your car? <laughs> you know, um, you, see, you see people with jewelry on and, and, and you, you know, you see people in a private jet. Listen, that jet never even took off. <laughs> they, ain't, they went nowhere in that jet. I stayed in the hangar. That was a photo op that they had to pay a couple hundred dollars for so they could put on the gram and they could look good like they're balling out. And they think it's going to help their image. But a lot of people can see right through that. And I know that's a, a version of extreme pretending. And we can say, oh, I'll never do all that. That's crazy. But all of us have probably done some pretending at some point and acted like we had a little bit more than we had, whether it was in real life or whether it was on social media. And we can tend to do that, right? Or sometimes we can think, well, I need this thing in order to look successful, right? I need to have this kind of car. I need to pull up in this kind of car at this thing so I can look like I'm I need to have this $3,000 purse. I need to have this certain kind of brand designer that I'm wearing. So then people will think um, I'm here. I'm not there yet, but I want to look successful. So they'll think, look at me, y'all. Stop. Stop doing that. Be real. Be who you are now. Maybe someday you'll be able to get that. But if that's not where you're at today, stop faking it. Listen, look at the person next to you. I, I would say grow up and act your age, but look at the person next to you and say grow up and act your wage. <laughs> like, what do you have right now? Live within your wage right now. It's okay. It's okay. Be real. We're going to help you with this in the next couple weeks. You heard of 21 days of prayer and fasting? We're going to do a 21-day spending fast. Oh, yeah. Get ready. Pastor Chris was going to talk a little bit about this at the end of service. Uh, this is going to be on the website. It's going to be a PDF. You're going to save a lot of money. You're going to be able to do a lot of new things after this 21 days. We're going to talk about it, but we want to help you because you're getting this information, but we want to give you some action steps that we're going to do. Somebody say together. Yeah. We're going to do it together because this stuff is hard. Some of the options we talked about last week, we're like, oh, yeah, I got to do that. Got to do that. How many of y'all did some stuff this week? Raise your hand. Okay, good. But see all the hands that aren't up? Well, I'm not, I didn't get to it yet, Pastor T. You're going to. You're going to get to it. We're going to start this coming up in just a couple of days. We're going we're gonna to let you know, right? So, so how do I break the comparison trap? How do I break the imposter trap? How do we break it? It starts with gratitude. We got to be grateful. I decided to wear the shirt today. Just so happened I, I was already planning on wearing this anyway. Look what God, look what God did, right? You got to be grateful for what God's already entrusted you with, what he's already given you. Because we all got some things to say, man, I could be grateful for these things. And, and God's given it to us. And like we just to get to hold it for a little while. So we got to maximize it for God's glory. Right? It's not yours. It, it's his. We just get to hold it for a little bit. We can't take any of this with us. So, so how can I leverage that for what God wants me to do? Once you get that gratitude part, then you know what comes in? Humility. The humility part. One of my mentors, uh, Pastor Rick Warren, he said this. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Say less. Let me read that for you one more time. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Uh, it's thinking of yourself less. Right? So it's not humiliation, but it's realizing, like, it's not all about me. And that's countercultural. Because culture tells us it's all about you. You deserve it. You should get it. Right, but real humility helps us see other people's needs, other people's passions, other people's like visions and purposes, and, and we want to help them, and we want to serve them, right? Then we move to real contentment because we're not searching for happiness and stuff. We, we find it in, in, in what we're doing with our creator and how we're serving other people, right? I love what First Timothy says. It says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Most of our culture is not content because they're on this never-ending chase for more stuff. And they get the stuff, and it makes them feel good for like five minutes, and then they want something else, right? Because new is always elusive, right? And we're always just trying to get more stuff, right? Here's the next lie that the culture tells us. Number two, um, you can borrow the money now, and you can pay it back later. You can borrow the money now, you can pay it back later, right? We call this BNPL, buy now, pay later. We already talked about credit card debt last week, right? Now, if you pay your credit card off every month before the, you know, the 30 days comes due, you know what? That's not dumb. That's actually smart if you have a rewards card. 
I know some people that make thousands of dollars a year doing that, but most of y'all can't do that. You can't be that disciplined, so just cut it up, have plastic surgery, right? <laughs> but, but here's the other thing that started. The BNPL industry over the past five years has exploded like a 1,000%, and that's this. That's not a credit card, but it's when you see something online that you want and you can't afford it right now, but you can buy now and pay later for like 12 easy payments of, and you're like, oh, I could afford an extra like $45 a month for that. I could get it right now. This is great. This is awesome, right? And you connect your debit card to it. But there's people that have done that with multiple things, and they, they didn't like they didn't strategize and realize what the impact was going to be on their budget, and now they are stressed out. About a third of people that have gotten into these things, they're not even able to pay them. And, and things are like falling apart, right? And they're stressed out, and their mental health is going crazy, right? A anybody here ever over leverage? Where you thought you could pay something back quicker than you really could? Anybody here an optimist like me? I mean, it's good in a lot of areas, but not always in this situation. I've done it before. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, we can pay this back quick. Let me just, yeah, do this, and we'll, you know, move some things around, and then we'll, and then you know, the money didn't come in like I thought it was going to come in, and then you're stuck with a whole bunch of interest payments. Ah, oh, it hurts, right? can turn you into a slave to your debt. Proverbs 22, 7, it tells us that the rich, a.k.a. the banks, rule over the poor. Most people, right? And look at the second part. The borrower is slave to the lender. We can become slaves to our debt as a culture pumps the lie. Just borrow it now. Instant gratification. Just get it now. You can pay it back later. It's easy. It's not easy. It's expensive. It's painful in a lot of sections, right? Uh, look at the person next to you and say, stop doing that. <laughs> Only buy when you have the money. Right? I want to help you out with that because some of you still might not get that concept. I want to do a little throwback video. Uh, this will help you. I think this will help you a lot. Check this video out real quick. Yeah. That video is a, is a classic that I, that I had to break out. Um, I got a friend of mine that I want to bring out that his, his, he's an expert in helping people like smash lies about money, about investing, even about crypto and all that kind of stuff. Some of you guys may know him, may follow him online. He's always dropping a lot of gems. I want you guys to welcome my friend Armando, a.k.a. Tall Guy Tycoon. Y'all give it up for him. What's up, man? Welcome. I appreciate you having me. So, Armando, tell, tell everybody just a little bit about your story. Uh, so, um, I started off, I guess, after college as a software engineer. Uh, I, worked, I, I moved to Tampa in 2012. I went to USF. Uh, and I was a software engineer at AAA um, for Veterans uh, Expressway for a while. Uh, and then uh, around 2015, me and my business partner started a company called ICO Ranker. Uh, he got acquired by a publicly traded company. All of a sudden, I had a bunch of money. Uh, and also it went public on, it was, at the time it was one of the biggest blockchain uh, purchases or acquisitions mm. ever. Uh, and that was a long time ago, 2017. So I, I kind of blew up on social media off of it, right? So, yeah. And that kind of uh, started me down a path of, uh, of teaching people about building wealth, teach, teach people how to invest in, uh, in tech, and also just make smart, strategic uh, money decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads me to where we are today. So what would you say, in your mind, what's one of the biggest lies that culture tells us about money? Uh, I like what you said about always trying to chase what the next person has. You'll always be behind when you do that. But one yeah. of the biggest, I think, is that people always say, if I just had more money, all my problems would go away. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing, right? Is that, uh, your problems wouldn't go away. They would just get scaled up. Right? So if you can't manage 30000 it's hard to manage $30 million. And I've seen it. I've, <laughs> yep. You know, Preach. But, uh, I, you know, on social media, I do meet a lot of celebrities and athletes. And I sit down, they always, you know, come sit and eat dinner with me. Yeah. And I'm, they're, they're not, they don't have as much money as people think. <laughs> because yeah. they yeah. didn't learn those money principles along the way. All of a sudden, they had a bunch of money, and their problems get scaled up. Instead of paying for a $100 bridge, they're paying for a $1,000 bridge. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking commercial jets, they're taking private jets. And I've seen people blow through ridiculous amounts of money like that. Uh, millions and millions. Of, yeah. like, How did you spend this much in one year? It's because their problems got scaled up. They didn't learn yeah. how to manage the money along the way. Yeah, and then a lot of times they just think the money's going to keep coming. That's and, another thing. And NFL right? stands yeah. for not for long. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, and so you get injured or you get cut or something happens, and then suddenly, like, 
they're back to square one. And some, there's a lot of athletes that go bankrupt. Because they, they don't plan ahead. You always have yeah. to plan. And I always tell people this, when it comes to money, you have to plan past your lifetime. You have, to, you have to plan everything that you do from here until past your life. And I say past your life because you want to pass on assets to your kids. So you have to plan for them right now. And a lot of people fail to do that because they think, well, you know, I don't have problems. I'll just keep making this money. There are always ups and downs. Yeah. There's always droughts and there's always, uh, you know, plentiful times. So you have to plan for those droughts. Yeah, so you always, man, I watch you on social media regularly, and you're always dropping gems about the stock market, crypto market, investing, and and what's what's some of the big mistakes that people make, even with that? Because I know you you always kind of talk people through the emotions when things start to go down. You're like, hey, hold on, <laughs> you know. Uh, you have to constantly learn. You have to constantly uh, get the knowledge about the stock market because uh, anything you do, uh, whatever decision you make in life, if you uh, if you're governed by emotions, mm-hmm. uh, that's buying a car, buying a house, whatever, you almost always make a bad decision. If you go into a car lot and you don't already have your plan out, the, the, the salesman is trained to trigger emotion. Yeah. So he's trained to trigger your, your pride, mm-hmm. or he's trained to trigger your excitement or your desire to have this car, and they'll try to trigger that. And then they'll have you to do something that you normally wouldn't do. My brother told me, we, we talked about it the other day, he was like, when you go into a car lot, they're trained to, sh- you say, well, my budget is 20000 They're trained to show you one at 20, one at 18, and one a little bit over the 20000 you said. Uh, mm. That's a lot better than that mid range. So you, oh, you know, I could pay 25 And then, oh, okay, what about this one? This is 30 And pretty soon you walk out with a $40,000 car, mm. and you only, you know, only went in there and spent 20000 yeah. But that's how it works, right? They're triggering that emotion in you. Yeah. And you make bad decisions. So even with the stock market, you have to constantly push those emotions down and try to make rational decisions. Yeah. So let's talk about crypto for a second. Because you're like the you're you're kind of like the crypto guru you've been and you've seen the crypto market go through a lot of highs and lows. So um what do you think about crypto and where do you think it's going? Uh, so the crypto market is like any other market, right? Uh so who who's in the crypto? We got a couple people here. Uh, But stocks, crypto, even your house, right, is that uh, people look at crypto and they say, oh, it crashed. But it's all over the scam because it dropped 30% or 20%. And the only reason we see that because the news tells us that, hey, this is happening, this is happening. But did you know that your house drops value every day? And some of it goes down 5,000, goes up 20,000, goes down 20, but you don't see that. Uh, If you watch Zillow, you do. (laughs) If you you look at Zillow Zillow regularly, you you can see. Most people don't. Yeah, yeah. But if you had a big... uh, display on your front door and it told you where the price was to that day, let's say you walked home, you went all went home today and the price dropped 20000 Would you panic? You'd be like, I had yeah. to go up because over time, houses yeah. tend to go up. It's the same thing with stocks and crypto is that you stop worrying about the small fluctuations and think about it long term. Just like houses, over time, those things will go up. You stop thinking about the day-to-day fluctuations. That's good. That's good. So, Armando, how can people find you, man, and see all the, the gems that you're regularly dropping about investing and stocks and saving and, and uh, finances? Yeah, so it's, it's just Tall Guy Tycoon on all platforms except for, I got to say, X.com. I keep telling them to say Twitter. Twitter, I know. <laughs> Somebody young told me. They don't say Twitter no more. So. <laughs> but we still call it a tweet, though, don't we? Yeah, what do we call it, an X? It <laughs> but uh, it's an underscore Tall Guy Tycoon. That's T-A-L-L-G-U-Y-T-Y-C-O-O-N. It's also on uh, Instagram. YouTube, everywhere is the same. Just call that type of thing. Cool. We'll definitely tap in with this guy. He is regularly helping a lot of different people and uh, helping them break some of the lies about money and about investing and about finances. And uh, also wrote a book called The Strategic Millionaire, right? Uh, yeah. So, on yeah. Amazon. Uh, so, it basically teaches you uh, uh, how to invest smart uh, in a smart way and also how to uh, see money more strategically instead of seeing it uh, emotionally. So. Awesome. Crossover fam, come on, give it up for our guy Armando. Tall guy tycoon. Thank you, bro. So fam, today I want to give you guys one third final live, right? Where's all my married people at? Married people in the house, make some noise. Single people in the house that want to be married someday in Jesus' name, make some noise. Whoa, okay. So this this part is for all y'all. Right? Because that was probably almost everybody that made some noise, right? A lot of people, right? Here's the third lie. Husbands and wives will always fight about money. That's a lie that a lot of us buy into. Now, listen, this does quite often happen. 
Can I get an amen? amen? Like, let's be real. It happens. People fight about money regularly. It actually is one of the number one causes of divorce. It gets stressful. Me and my wife, have we fought about money before? Absolutely. Especially early in our marriage when we were still trying to get on the same page with everything. We came from different backgrounds. We had different thoughts about things. We were, we were young, and we weren't fully on the same page with that. But once we got on the same page, like, we don't fight about money no more. Is money sometimes a point of tension? Absolutely. Because sometimes we don't have enough of it. We feel like that, right? Or we can't get something we want, or we have to uh, delay something, or we have to not do something, you know, or stop doing something. So, but, but you know what? We have conversations about it. We look at our budget together, and we become wise, right? We're mature now. And here's the biggest thing, y'all. We're on the same team. Somebody say same team. Same. We're on the same team. And, and that's the thing. That, that's the main thing that messes a lot of people up. I mean, me and my wife have talked to so many couples over the years that fight about, about money. And so we say, well, tell us about your money situation. And, and then we hear the, the, the story start rolling out. Well, you know, he owes me money. How does he owe you money? Like you're married, right? Well, he borrowed $500 from me. He ain't never paid me back, right? Or, well, she, she pays for the Wi-Fi bill, and she ain't paying it, and the Wi-Fi got cut off at our house now. And, like, that's her bills. I pay for this. I'm like, wait, what, y'all live in the same house? <laughs> like, like the Bible says the two will become what? One. one. Right? That means not just one in the bedroom, but one in the boardroom where decisions are made together. One in the bank account where the money is pooled together, right? The two will become one. Me and my wife, we put everything together. When we first got married, we came into the marriage with a little bit of school loans. We put it together. I wasn't like, oh, no, your school loan's higher than mine. Like, that's your problem. Like, you did that before we were married. Like, no, it's ours together now, right? The two become one, right? My wife and I, we got a joint account. Our, 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 everything goes into that Join account. We pay our bills together because we're together. We're on the, somebody say same team. Same team. Right? Now, understand if you have a business, like some of us do, you, you have a separate account maybe for the business and there's separate accounting for that and all that. I get that. But you still need to have a main account that everything is together and you're paying the bills together of the home. Right? Somebody again say same team. Same team. I'm telling you, that eliminates a lot of fights, y'all. It does. Ephesians chapter 5, there's a passage that gives roles of husbands in wives, and it talks about uh, wives submitting to their husbands, and then it talks about uh, husbands loving their wives as Christ loves the church. Now, a lot of husbands, they love to quote verses 22 to 24. See, woman, you got to submit. Submit, woman, right? Are you worth submitting to? Okay? It's in the Bible. You're supposed to do that, yes, but, but you also have to lead well, right? But also, if you take the passage in context... If you take it in context, the, the very first verse that's in there is verse 21, and it says, submit to one another. Submit to one another in reverence for Christ. So guess what? Even though I'm the husband, I'm the spiritual leader of my home, there's some areas I'm going to submit to my wife in because she's better than me at some things. And I can easily admit that. I can't cook. That woman can cook. She's good at administration. She's good at organizing things. She's good at paying the bills. I can do maybe some of those things, but they're not my sweet spot. They're not what I, what I love. I'm an artist. I'm, I'm doing other creative stuff, right? Um, at the same time, there's things that I'm way better at than she is. And she trusts me and she submits to me in those areas because, again, we're, we're on the same team. Somebody say same team. Same team. And so we know what our, our roles are, even in the house. I'm the spiritual leader, but we know that our roles in some of these other areas and we work together. When you work together and you have that communication, man, it is a beautiful thing. We seek God's guidance. We pray together. We communicate together. We talk. And there's peace. That's why we still live pretty young. Because there ain't a whole bunch of stress in our home. People are like, what's your secret? I'm like, I got a good marriage. Because stress will age you. It'll age you. And we're good. Like, it's peaceful at home. Right? Ephesians 4 gives us some great advice, not just for marriage, but for all close relationships, it says this. It says, always be what? Humble. Humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. 
Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. But if we break down some of those key words there, you know what our spiritual enemy, he wants us to be the opposite of humble. He wants us to be dripping with pride, right? He doesn't want us to be gentle. He wants us to be violent. He doesn't want us to be patient. He wants us to be impatient and frustrated and mad at the other person. He doesn't want us to love. He wants us to hate. Satan has created lies that our culture has bought into about money, and it's got a lot of people in spiritual bondage. A lot of people are in bondage, y'all. Some of you are in bondage today because you've fallen for some of these lies. And when you get exposed to the truth and you apply the truth, the truth will set you free. And you'll be free indeed. I want to pray for you today. If you bow your heads with me around the room. If you're here today and you can admit, man, I've fallen for some of the lies and, and I, need, I need to be set free. I see the truth. First of all, the truth of the gospel that we've all messed up. We've all fallen for lies that the culture has told us. And we've made mistakes. We've sinned. And we can't fix it. It doesn't matter how many strategies we put in place, how many people we help, how many people we serve, how many times we come to church. We can't fix it in our own strength. That's why God, our Heavenly Father, sends only Son Jesus down to the earth to die on the cross for our mistakes and our sins and the times we bought into some of the lies that the culture feeds us. We can be forgiven and get a clean slate. There's going to be some consequences sometimes of those decisions, but God can help us rebuild and get things on the right track. But all that first starts with where are you at with Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Because freedom... And truth starts with that. So if you're here today, family, in this room, or if you're streaming this from your room or your car or wherever you're at today, and you would say, Pastor Tommy, I need to get right with Jesus. I, I, I need to start a relationship with him, or I need to reconnect with Jesus. Maybe you were close to him at one time, but you've fallen off and there's been distance. So if you're here today, family, and you say, Pastor T, that's me, I want you to just lift your hand up. I want to pray for you in a moment. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I see your hands. God sees your hands all over this room. If you're worshiping online at home, you can just type in the chat. If you're by the chat, put pray for me. I'm going to pray for you as well. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just say these words. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for exposing truth. I apologize that I've fallen for some lies. I've made mistakes. I've sinned. But today, September 22nd, 2024, I ask you to forgive me. Make me brand new. Help me to follow the truth. Shine light into the darkness in my life. I believe you can change everything. That's what I ask you to do today. Give me the strength and courage to take my next spiritual steps. And I thank you for loving me and not giving up on me. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're here today and maybe you already have a relationship with Jesus, but you could say today, like, the message spoke to you and those, there were some lies that you've fallen into and, and you've got to do better, you need to do better. In, in some of these areas with your finances to not just survive inflation, but to flourish even in these tough times. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. Father, we come before you today, and I lift up my family. I thank you for all the people that just prayed that prayer, the dozens and dozens of people, God, here in this room and from all over, God. We thank you for what you're doing in our church and through our church, God. We're so grateful you are moving. And God, this is a... a a tough topic, like we said today, Lord, it's a, it's a dark subject for so many of us when it comes to finances and budgets and debt and all those things. And God, I pray for my family that has their hands up around the room. You know exactly some of the things that they're dealing with right now. And God, I pray for breakthrough. I pray for discipline. I pray for miracles to happen. I pray as we get ready to do this 21-day spending fast 
that you're going to change the trajectory of our family tree. This is literally going to be the beginning of some things that get us out of the trap, the financial trap, the broken brokenness that uh, generational cycles have had in our family. Like we're going to break that even in the next 21 days with your help. So God, I declare that and I pray that for my family today. We thank you for what you're doing in this house. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Bless you guys.